Hello and welcome to my channel, my name is Leo and what I have here today is a Seiko that was born in March 1970. Inside is the 7005A movement and you might say that's almost the same what you showed us last time Leo. Kind of. There are some differences, there is no day dial, it has less jewels etc. But the main difference, we have completely different issues to solve so it might be a very similar movement but it's a very different video. Cleaning and lubricating won't do it. This one needs the equivalent of a hip replacement to make it happy. I didn't think this one was going to make it on YouTube, I thought it was really ugly. But when it gets a complete makeover, it's a very different watch. Everything works. It's not great, but it works. It was described as keeping good time, but it doesn't. But we don't want that, do we? We want something challenging to work on. Not just to take it apart, clean it, put it back together, lubricate it and voila. That's nice and easy, and I'd like that sometimes. But we want some challenges. That's the only way to progress. You have to get out of your comfort zone and do something new. Something different. Something you might be scared of to do. Something you might possibly screw up. That's why you need a bunch of scrap movements to train on. They don't have to work. As long as you have a plate with jewels or bushings, you can push them out, push them in. If it's your first time, that's the way to do it. I love this case opener, this is the Bergen one, it's a beautiful tool, you feel confident using it, you know you're not going to scratch anything, there is no way you can slip. But you don't have to spend that kind of money, when I bought this one, there were no Chinese replicas around, but you now have the option to buy very much the same opener for a lot less money. I do like nice tools, my wallet doesn't like it, but I do. This is the problem with watchmaking, everything is just so expensive, but what can you do? You often wonder. Do I buy this one or this much more expensive one that looks the same? What is the difference? That's just it. Who knows? Basically, you get what you pay for. I'm not sure that's exactly correct because you can pay 10 times more for the Swiss versions of tools and you don't get 10 times the quality, but generally, you get better quality. I'm giving it a full wind and with the magic of video editing, I left it standing for 30 minutes. I didn't put it straight on. You need to leave it to settle for a little while. And now we can have a look at it before I take it apart. It's not looking great, is it? Minus 100 seconds a day, amplitude 139 degrees. In this position, minus 707 seconds a day, amplitude 134 degrees. It's even worse. And the pendant position, minus 449 seconds a day, and the amplitude is just wrong. It can be 354 degrees. The time grapher can't even read it. So, we have some work to do to make this right. And I wonder what could be wrong with it. Yes, I know you've seen the title. You know I'm doing a voiceover. But I'm telling a story. I'm living it again. This is better than Hollywood. That's why you're watching this, not Netflix. And look at this. Watch this. Isn't that magic? It is if you've seen my previous video, because I had a serious battle with it trying to get the movement out of the case. I'm going to set the hands in a position so I can easily remove them. And watch this, look at the seconds hand. Look at that, it stopped just where you want it. I feel like I have superpowers. It's hand levers for me guys, I've never used the Presto tool and I never will. I want to be in control when I'm using tools. It might be a good tool, I see a lot of guys using it, but it's not for me. I want to feel and see it. I want to put the pressure exactly where I want. These need rotating roughly 180 degrees. As long as they are out of the cut in the dial feed, you good. Now the feet are free to move, I can remove the dial. There is a ring between the dial and the movement. That's not always the case, but it is with this movement. I'm gently going to do it with my screwdriver. You need to take your time here. You always have at least two dial feet, and if you lift it too much on one side, you risk bending the other foot and potentially breaking it. You don't want to do that, you'd create yourself a lot of unnecessary work. Sometimes they come off very easily, sometimes they don't. It will eventually come off. Take your time and you'll get there. And here we go. Let me remove the rotor, some also call it the oscillating weight. As you move your wrist, this part moves around thanks to gravity. On the underside, you have a gear with teeth and that connects to other gears as it keeps moving around and winds the mainspring. It keeps it wound as long as you are reasonably active. 
you can see the gear here. Whenever you see a screw with three slots, it means it's reverse threaded. You'll come across them now and again. They are reverse threaded because of the direction the wheel rotates. If it wasn't reverse threaded, there would be a risk of the screw coming loose. The wheel I'm trying to remove is called the second reduction wheel. That's also part of the automatic winding mechanism. And this one is stubborn. Are you going to play the ball or do I have to force you? This is classed as cruelty to reduction wheels. I have a good lawyer. It's the reduction wheel that's going to end up behind the case back. Five years minimum. See that? That connects to the ratchet wheel on the right. That's the pole lever. I'll move it out of the way. What I'm doing now is unwinding the mainspring, known as letting the power down. It's very important. You can't skip this step. Now there is no power, we can remove the ratchet wheel, and I can already see some wear. See it below the ratchet wheel on the right? It's very common if it's not serviced regularly, especially with these movements with bushings. Doesn't look very dirty, but the wear on the bridge is bad. Let's get the balance out. It's always a good idea to remove it as soon as you can. They are delicate, but you don't have to be scared of them. The first time I was removing a balance, it was on a Unitas 6497 movement and I was petrified. I had sweat on my forehead, death in my eyes, it felt like the world was going to end if I do the wrong move. You have to be careful, that's correct, but it's not going to melt as soon as you touch it with your tweezers. Be gentle, make sure your tweezers are not too close to the hairspring, they shouldn't be anyway because you are going to lift the balance arm and the balance and the hairspring will lift with it. Make sure you don't catch the balance wheel under a bridge and pull the hairspring and possibly stretch the hairspring in the process of it and you'll be fine. It's really not that bad. It's just a part that's a bit more delicate than the other parts. After a while you won't even think about it. Practice makes perfect. There you go, I completely missed out the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge while talking about the delicacy of the balance. Delicacy. That's not right is it? Delicateness? That doesn't sound too good either. Fragility! That's the one! Anyway, let's move on. We're on the dial side and it's all hiding under the dial guard I'm about to remove. If you're wondering what size the movement holder is, it's 12 and a quarter. I'm not a huge fan of them. They're absolutely fine, there's nothing wrong with them, but when you lift parts, you can sometimes lift the whole movement. You could hold the movement down with your finger as long as you were in finger cuts, but for me, for video work, they are not that great. I'd be casting shadows and blocking your view. I wonder what disasters we're going to find under the cover. All looks pretty clean. We'll have a close look at it in a minute. And the cover itself looks fine to me. That's the date jumper. It keeps the date dial in a position. Let me take it out. This one is not going to be easy, I can tell. It's not really as stubborn as it looks. Normally I turn the movement, but under macro it would look very jerky. And I don't want you to watch jerky footage. Plus, it's fun to watch someone struggle. As long as it's not you. As humans enjoy things we know we shouldn't, but we do. That's the hour wheel. The hour hand goes directly on it and it turns once every 12 hours. This is the minute wheel. Nothing to do with minutes. It connects the cannon pinion and the hour wheel. That's the intermediate date wheel. It connects the hour wheel and the date driving wheel. It's great when I struggle. I get the time to explain what is what. When I was taking it apart, I knew I'd need the time to explain what is what. For example, the cannon pinion where the hour wheel was before. That's friction fit and it's on the center wheel, which is part of the train. The minute hand goes directly on it and it does one full rotation every 60 minutes. This is the connection between the motion sign and the train. That's the calendar mechanism. The big wheel is called the date driving wheel and the part on the top is called the date finger. It does one full rotation every 24 hours and changes the date. I was going to take the date finger off to show you it's a separate part, but I've given up. That's the friction fit cannon pinion I was talking about. See there is the center wheel on the other side of the main plate. This is the keyless mechanism. It spans from here to there. 
It's for setting the time, setting the date, and with many watch movements for winding the watch, but not this one. You can only wind this one with the movement of your hand. It's to keep the cost down. That's the tail end of the yoke that acts as a spring. I'm going to release the tension before I do anything. This is the setting lever spring that keeps everything in place. Let me show you the screw. I do that because not all screws are the same. When it comes to assembling it, I can look at the footage and identify the screws I need very easily. Now let me remove the spring. Let's have a look at the underside whether it's messy or not. Doesn't look bad. Sorry, I didn't mean to blind you there. Now the yoke can go. That's the setting lever. A jumpy setting lever. And finally I can remove the stem and the clutch. That's it. We're done on the motion side. We haven't got that much to do to take it all apart. This is the train bridge, or train and barrel bridge to be precise. Sometimes you get them separate. I prefer that because you have less pivots to line up during the assembly. That can be painful. Sometimes it falls in place. Sometimes you spend ages getting all the pivots in. The wear on the bridge, just above the ballo, you see that often on these movements. When something is worn, you need to do something about it. Cleaning won't do the trick. Let me take it all apart and then we'll have a close look at it. This holder keeps the reduction wheel in place. You just need to push on it to snap it out of place. I can already see the dried out grease below the holder. This hasn't been serviced for quite some time. You can see it's bone dry. Let me lift the bridge and let's have a look at it. It doesn't look nasty but it does look very dry. Let me move the pole lever out of the way. Not too bad, just dry. That's the click that keeps the ratchet wheel from unwinding. That's the fourth wheel, it goes through the center wheel. It does one full rotation every 60 seconds. The second hand attaches on the end of it. That's the third wheel. It's an intermediate wheel that's between the center wheel and the fourth wheel. This is the escape wheel. That's the last wheel in the train. It meshes with the fourth wheel that rotates once a minute and makes contact with the pallet fork that starts and stops the escape wheel. This is the barrel. That's the first wheel in the train. It's the power source. The mainspring is inside the barrel. And finally the center wheel. This is the second wheel in the train, but it's called the center wheel. It turns once an hour. The cannon pinion that was removed not long ago is friction fitted to this wheel. It's always a good idea to remove the cannon pinion at an early stage. You don't want to have a loose center wheel and remove the cannon pinion in that state. It's better to remove the cannon pinion when the center wheel is secured between the main plane and its bridge. Whether it's a separate one like this one or the train bridge. I'm going to go super quick through this section because my videos are really long. As much as I'd like to include everything, I can't do it because I'd scare everyone off clicking on my videos. I did cover quite a lot about the differences between the Seiko and the General Resorts mainsprings in my last video. There are differences. I'll put the link in the video in the description. Okay, let's have a look at what's causing the wear. We've just got the ball out between the plates. We get a true picture of what it's like when the ball is not in the way and the side shake is not really that bad. I found it difficult to record the side shake of the other side from the top, but I have found a way to show you. Pay attention here. See how it moved? The movement is greater than what you can see because the pivot is further down. When we have a look at the bushing in the barrel bridge, there is where you can see the brass, but it's not drastic. On the other side, in the main plate, that is drastic. This is the end of the world. No, it's not the end of the world. Stop stocking up toilet rolls, baked beans or whatever you stuck up with. We can easily fix that. We don't have a bushing to push out in the main plate like we do in the bridge, but there is a way. We're going to put new jewels in. These are from VTA, which stands for Vintage Time Australia. They are not your standard size jewels. These are custom made for this movement. They make jewels for all kinds of Seiko movements. If you need some for yours, go on eBay and search for VTA jewels. There is no point asking me whether they do some for your movement. The answer to that is, I don't know. I'll put some links in the description to start you with, and you will have to do your own research.
What we need for this job is a jeweling tool and the bits that come with it. A jeweling tool is primarily designed to push jewels in and out. You push the lever and that pushes down the spring loaded spindle. This is the spindle. This is the pusher. You insert it in the spindle. You have to choose which one you want to use. You get a selection of various diameters and types of pushers. I'll show you in a moment. And this is the stake. You place the part with the jewel to be pushed out or inserted on the stake. Again, you get a selection of these. To adjust how far you want to push the jewel in, there is a micrometer here. Let's say if I just pushed a jewel in and decided that I wanted to push it two hundreds of a millimeter further down, I'd rotate the micrometer two divisions clockwise, in this case it would be 52 and a half. And next time I push the lever, the spindle and hence also the pusher will push down two hundreds of a millimeter further down than the previous time. It's on a thread so it's easy to turn. One full rotation will be one millimeter. In this case, I turned it 82 hundreds of a millimeter down. The screw on the right is to secure the micrometer in place so it doesn't accidentally rotate. Notice there's another screw here and it's in line with the groove in the spindle. That's to stop the spindle from rotating. Let me show you how it protrudes through the body. See that there? That screw is removable because this tool is a double act. It's also a reamer. A reamer is basically a drill. Let me show you. You remove the handle. You remove the spindle. Let me take the stake out. And you also remove the screw. Now you can insert a different spindle in. This one doesn't have a groove in it because this one needs to rotate. And this is how you remount holes. It's done with your fingers. There is a nice knurling on the spindle. You of course need to insert a reamer in the spindle. These are the bits that come with the jeweling tool. Here are the stakes. You get a row of simple pushers, pump pushers, concave pushers and a row of reamers. There's a close up of the reamers for you. And here's a close up of the simple pushers. Let's start with the bushing in the bridge. You place the bridge on the stake and use a pusher that's smaller in diameter than the bushing. You press the lever on the jeweling tool and that's it, it's out. The jewel that will replace the bushing, the outer diameter of it is larger than the bushing so we need to ream out the hole to make the jewel fit. I'm using a 2.59mm reamer. The jewel that will go in has diameter of 2.6mm, one hundred of a millimeter larger than what the hole will be. The instructions for everything you need to do are in the description of the jewels when you get them on eBay. I'm applying hardly any pressure here. You don't want to force it. Take it nice and easy. Let me remove the swarf. Let's flick it off. Also note that for the reaming, I'm not using the stake. The bridge is directly on the jeweling table. Go nice and gentle. And you're supposed to go all the way in. See the smooth round part, past the cutting part? That smooths it out after cutting. That's it. Now you can remove it. The hole in the main plate is for the ball arbor pivot. We're going to have to ream it out to make it large enough for the diameter of the outer diameter of the jewel. That's done step by step, one reamer after another. You can't just barge in with the reamer you want to ream it out to. I'll start with the 1.09 reamer, go one by one until I get to the 1.59 reamer. The jewel itself is 1.6 millimeter in diameter. Okay, I'm going to start with the 1.09 reamer and just like before, straight on the jeweling table, not on a stake and nice and easy. This one is actually easy. It doesn't have the one tenth of a millimeter to shave, so it goes in like nothing. All the way in. You probably don't need to go in all the way. If you're going to be using other reamers to enlarge it further as in this case, the last reamer would probably be just fine. I didn't push it in in the reamer hard enough. The reamer stayed in and the spindle was out. I've seen other jeweling tools that use a collet. That would be nicer than pushing the reamer in the spindle. 
I wasn't going to torture you and show you every single reamer, but I did go one by one, and this final one is 1.59mm reamer. I'm not speeding it up so you can see the swarf forming. I hope you're enjoying that. One thing I wanted to mention. You are supposed to go all the way in, past the cutting section to smooth it out. But a friend of mine who's been doing this all his life, went to school in Switzerland in his young days, told me that he never goes all the way in because he had a jewel that came out. Just because I show you something here, it doesn't mean it's the only way. It doesn't mean it's the best way. Something I do now, I might change that in a couple of months because I found a better way. You might find a better way of doing things than what you've seen in my videos, and that's good. That means you're progressing. Let's not forget about the day dial guard. It's quite difficult to see, but if you look here, you will see that it's on the top of the main plate. The hole that is there is for the barrel pivot. We need to enlarge that for the jewel. It's all in the instructions in the description on eBay. By the way, this is not some promotional video. I bought the jewels for the full price with my own money. I started with 1.39 reamer, but I skipped that because by now you should have a good idea how it's all done, and I'm showing you the final 1.79 reamer. If there was a 1.69 reamer in the set, I'd go for that because the jewel is 1.6 millimeters, but there isn't one, so I went for the 1.79. This is actually more awkward than the bridge and the main plate because it's very thin and it flexes. I'll let you relax to that, guys. It's very satisfying. There we go, everything is reamed out now. Now we need to tidy up. These are burrs and they are 120 degrees angle. You can put them in a pin vise and deburr the plates. Very, very lightly. It looks like I'm pressing very hard, but the camera is lying to you, trust me. It's awkward because the lens is right there. I can't even keep it dead upright because of the lens. Let me sweep it up with Rodico. I had to go gently over it without the lens in the way, and now I'm happy. Do it on both plates, both sides, and don't forget about the date dial guard. Now I've got the stake there. I positioned the jewel in the hole as straight as I could. I'm going to be pushing the jewel in from the inside. I want the jewel nice and flush with the plate, just like it was when it was just a hole in the plate. Because I want it flush, I'm using a simple or flat pusher that is larger in diameter than the jewel. This one is probably too large, but let's see how it's going to go. It's going in. A little bit more. I can't see what you can see. I'm on the other side. Let me have a look. I'm not sure. I'm going to try a smaller diameter pusher. This one is still larger in diameter than the jewel. I think the pusher before did the job. Yeah, that's fine. And from the other side, it's supposed to be raised. It's fine. But look at this. See that? The stake marked the plate. That's what you get when you buy a Swiss tool for over a thousand pounds. Unbelievable. I'm going to have to tidy up that stake and check all the others. And the side where it matters looks good. It looks like it's pushed in when you look here, but the camera is lying to you again. You need to look here. It's nice and flush. This is a nice stake. This one is made by Horia. Same again guys, the jewel is positioned in the hole and I'm going to be pushing the jewel in with a simple pusher that's larger in diameter than the jewel to make it nice and flush. The pusher will stop on the bridge and it will be exactly where it should be. There we go. How's that? Let's not forget to test it. It rotates nicely and the end shake and side shakes are there. Look at the state of that. Look at the edge. Both of them, inner and outer. I'll tidy it up. Maybe I should send an invoice to Bergeon. That's better now, but I shouldn't be doing this. I kept talking about the sizes of the holes and jewels, but I don't think I mentioned that the hole is always 100 of a millimeter smaller than the jewel. There's a certain amount of elasticity in the brass plates which will give when the jewel is pressed in. It's a press fit. 
I think, or to be precise, I'd like to think that by watching the video, you should now be able to do this yourself. Or if you're watching this because you enjoy videos but don't repair watches, you should have a good understanding of how it's done. Well, I'm overlapping here now, and what am I doing? I already took the balance out. As I told you a few minutes ago, just because I did something one way in the previous videos, it doesn't mean I'm going to do it the same way now. I now take the settings out before cleaning. The pivots will be just fine without the settings. Let's have a close look. See, the pivot is out of the way. You don't need the setting there for cleaning. And I keep settings separate because they are not necessarily always the same. So yes, I now take the settings out. Think about it. The pivots will get cleaned much better than if you leave the settings in place. Prior to cleaning, I'm removing as much grime as I can from the jewel holes with pegwood soaked in Horosol. Don't sharpen the pegwood nice and round like a pencil. Make some sides to it. It will clean it better. Everything's been cleaned. It's all nice and sparkling, I hope. And I can get on with the assembly. I always start with the barrel because it's kind of boring and I want it out of the way. Not boring as such, but it's not like when you're assembling the train or the keyless mechanism. You see it growing, the parts are interacting with each other. It brings up my childhood memories, playing with Meccano, building stuff, getting excited about what I can do with it, building paper card models, plastic models, planes, tanks, that kind of stuff. And the barrel, that reminds me when I used to have to assemble the wheels. I didn't like doing the wheels, but the cars wouldn't be any good without the wheels, just like the watch wouldn't be any good without the barrel and the mainspring. Right. The mainspring is in and I'm releasing the tension now. You need to do that, otherwise it will just snap into place and you don't want that. This is the combo I used, winder number 7 and blue arbor number 6. This is the Kluber P125 grease. I'm placing it in 5 spots on the barrel wall, equally spaced out. It's the stickiest braking grease I have in my arsenal and the most expensive grease. The winder actually sits on the barrel wall. It's not ideal. But winder number 6 is too small for my liking. I don't like the idea of compressing the mainspring too much, so I take the risk and hope that it's going to go in without any problems. And that's the Mobius 9504 grease. When it comes to barrels, I'm switching from oils to greases. It's high friction, high torque, I don't think grease will do any harm at all. And it's more likely to stay in place as opposed to oils. This is the usual Mobius A200 grease. I know, people generally put three dots of the grease on the lid, or the base, or both, but I prefer to brush it on the mainspring. It's just my way of doing it. I think it's going to spread better, more equally than the dots of the grease on the lid. I used to put a thin film of the grease on the mainspring prior to winding the mainspring in the mainspring winder, but I take the easy way now. I put it in three places, equally spaced out, and the grease will spread out over time. You just have to decide what you prefer. It probably doesn't really matter that much. That's the 9504 grease again. It's not as light as oils and you might say it might affect the amplitude. You could be right, but in all honesty, I'm not that concerned about the amplitude as much as many people are. Of course I'd like nice 300 degrees amplitude, but as long as it's not too low, I'm happy. What is more important to me is how long the lubricants will last and how accurate the timekeeping will be. All we need to do now is to snap the lid in place and the ballet is done. Now we can do more exciting stuff. I'm going to coat the end stones for the balance in Epilam. This one is made by Horotec and as opposed to the one made by Mobius, the drying step is at room temperature. The Mobius requires drying at 60 degrees. Why am I doing this? In short, to change the surface tension of the end stones and keep the oil from spreading. Now it's coated, dry, in place and I can use my automatic oiler to suspend some Mobius 9010 there. I was racing to say as much as I could there. You know, sometimes you take the footage, it's not very long, and when you do the voiceover, you find out that you don't have the time to say everything you want to say. So I do miss out some stuff at times, and most likely because I didn't have the time to talk about it. Sometimes I have too much time, and I end up talking about Meccano. Let me tidy it up a little bit with Rodico. Now the same treatment for the upper setting, I should mention that it's only the end stone I coated in Epilam, not the whole setting, and you're supposed to keep it in the bottle with the Epilam for about 30 seconds. I'm glad that this Epilam doesn't require the drying step with hot air at 60 degrees. I really wouldn't fancy pointing the hair dryer at something as small as the end stones. These shock springs are a pain in the backside. I much prefer the Swiss ones on a hinge, but it is what it is, you get used to them. 
Let me tidy up a little after myself. Now let's do a little test. Look at that, beautiful. No harm done cleaning the balance attached to the main plate with the settings removed. I can guarantee you that the pivots will be much cleaner doing it this way. If you are going to follow my way, make sure to check it before that the end shake is not too great and the pivots are not hitting the plate. Let's do the keyless first. I'm going to speed it up a little bit as the jeweling took quite some time and I want to keep the video a reasonable length. Whenever you see the pale blue color, it's the Mobius 9504 grease. Don't worry guys, the square section for the clutch will get coated in the grease on all sides. The way I have it set up for the camera makes it a little awkward so I'll do it off the camera. I'm going to touch it up a little here when it's in place. You only really need the grease on the sides here. The yoke only touches the sides. That's the section of the yoke where the setting lever goes. Again, I'm using 9504 grease here. A little bit here for the tail end of the yoke. And some on this post for the setting lever. A little bit here for the yoke. Let me tidy it up. That's it, we can put it all together. There isn't much to it. There is no winding with this movement. The yoke also acts as a spring, so we only have a very few parts here. This is the setting lever. Let me move it a little bit just to see that everything is fine. It's all good. This is the setting lever spring, and that's it. That's all the parts for this keyless. This keyless is as simple as it gets. It works well, there's nothing wrong with simplicity. This screw, I'm not going to screw it down fully as yet. I want to tuck in the tail end of the yoke here. Let me give it a little push. That's it. And now I can fully tighten the screw. Now let's test the keyless. The first position does nothing. There is no winding here. The second position sets the date. And the third position allows you to set the time. And everything appears to be working just fine. Okay, we can put the train together. And most of all, the barrel is already done. I'm going to start with the first reduction wheel. That's the Seiko S4 grease. It's got to be done before we put the bridge on. The clip that secures the reduction wheel in place is on the underside of the bridge. If we don't put the reduction wheel in first, we're going to have to take the bridge off because we'll have no way of putting the clip in place. It nicely snaps in. I think they call it a snap. There we go. And today, on the center wheel, I'm going to use the 9501 grease for a change. And on the top of the center wheel, I'm going to use HP 1300. Now why did I use 9501 on the center wheel, you may ask? I don't see any reason why not. I'm going to put some 9501 on it later on, just before I put the Canon pinion on. So I don't think the 9501 is a bad choice here. And we won't have, let's say if I used HP 1300, we won't have the HP 1300 mixing with the 9501 when I put it on for the Canon pinion. I don't think it will go wrong with the 9501, HP 1300, HP 1000, D5, etc. There is no ultimate lubricant. Little bit of 9504 on the bottle arbor before I put it in place. It has good high pressure resistance and wear resistance. I think it's a good choice for a barrel arbor. Now the escape wheel. That's the third wheel, straight in its place. What is going on in here? That is the tip of a blunt needle attached to a syringe loaded with epilum. The second hand goes on the pivot I'm coating, and I'm doing it because I don't want the oil spread in there. You'll see it now where the oil goes. See that? I'm putting 9020 oil just in the groove there. It's way too close to the second hand pivot. The epilam will stop the oil from spreading. Now let me put it in. Now the click. Some 9504 on the balaba, 9020 on the fourth wheel just here. I'm going to teach you how to do this flawlessly. Everything will go in the first time you put it down. You need to focus. You need to mentally visualize the pivots in the jewels. You need to see the pivots going in the jewels in your mind. Then put it down and it works 100%. About 3% of the time. And this was the other 97%. Now you have the option to do what I just told you other 96 times or just poke it around like I do now and you'll eventually get there it, 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 it's good advice 
You'll get to see it one day after I've released another 96 videos. And don't forget to use your left hand to align the escape wheel when you're right handed like me. That's also good. But we got there guys. It's in. It's all spinning. See what I mean when I say that assembling the battle is boring? How much more satisfying is this? I love assembling the train. That's probably the second most satisfying section of the assembly. The balance being the first, that's if it gets going, otherwise it's the most depressing part of the assembly. Look at that jewel, isn't that a beauty? It looks huge. I don't think it is huge, it didn't need much reaming. It's probably the Macrolands line to us. And now I'm going to hide it under not so exciting ratchet wheel. But you know the old saying, beauty is ratchet wheel deep. Let me hold the ratchet wheel from turning with the plastic probe. I prefer it to pegwood. When you put a bit of pressure on something like this with pegwood, you can sometimes find little remnants of the wood on the teeth. Escape wheel 9010, third wheel 9020, escape wheel 9010, third wheel 9020, reduction wheel pivot HP 1300, center wheel 9501 here for the cannon pinion. Little bit more from the other side. And let me put the cannon pin in and give it a push. Boom. I love making footage like that. The way I like to make my videos is for you to see it as if you were there. As if it was a structure you could walk in and walk under the bridges. It's not quite possible like that, and even if it was, it probably wouldn't be too helpful because we would be too close, but I still think it's nice to see everything in a great detail. I don't get to see it like this when I'm recording it. The camera is recording, but I still have my loop in my eye socket, and that's nowhere near as strong as my macro lens. Now let me find it just a little, and I'll lubricate the escapement. If you've seen my older videos, how I lubricated the exit pallet stone, I don't do it like that anymore. I don't think it was lubricated enough. I can't show you how I'm going to do it because the pallet stone is facing you, not me. I'm on the opposite side and I can't see it, but I can explain to you how I'm going to do it. Firstly, you can see the pallet fork is in place. I position it so I get access to the exit pallet stone and put in this case 941 oil on the exit pallet stone. Then I'll move the pallet fork back and forth so the escape wheel advances several teeth and I'll put another drop of 941 on the exit pallet stone. I'll do it about three times in total meaning three drops and that should hopefully be lubricated enough. If you ask the professionals they will tell you that this is how it's done. The time grapher will tell us the truth in a moment. We're almost there. The escapement is lubricated. Don't forget, you're not supposed to lubricate the pallet fork pivots. You don't lubricate the pallet fork horn either just the exit pallet stone. You could, you could put a touch of lubricant on the entry pallet stone if the trace on the time grapher is not looking great. It is possible that the lubricant didn't spread well, but you should leave it running for several hours before you do that. Now I'm going to give it a full wind, I'm going to leave it for 30 minutes and then I'll put it on the time grapher. That is a disaster. Now you're going to expect my next video to be just as good and that's not gonna happen. That's just lucky. Okay, I jeweled the barrel, cleaned it and lubricated it, but that's it. I didn't have to do anything else. I didn't even regulate it. I didn't touch the beater either. The amplitude, yes I'd like to see it around 300, but wouldn't we all? Am I disappointed with the amplitude? Not in the slightest. It's fine. It's a Seiko. It was born in March 1970 most likely the original mainspring, it's doing well. And the pendant positions, they are never as good as the dial up and dial down positions because the balance has to work harder and this one is no exception. I'll show you the pendant positions. But, I'll show you something different. I've got a new toy! Come and have a look! That is a Grainer microphone, by the looks of it from the last century, and the escapement analyzer. That's what it's called in the UK, anywhere else it's called the e-timer. Let's have a butcher, shall we? You know, butchers, butchers hook, hook, look. I'll teach you English. Let me click the positional average button. I'll click run here. And now let me show you around. Firstly, I must tell you that it didn't go straight from the time grapher here. It's been a few hours now, so the reading is not quite the same now. 
If you're used to the time grapher, you will be used to a horizontal line. Here the line is vertical and it's shown on this tape here. If it's perfectly straight, you're not gaining or losing time. If it leans to the left, it's losing time. If it leans to the right, it's gaining time. The data you are used to is here on the left. The rate, amplitude and beta. The train speed is here and the lift angle is here. This tells you it's in a measuring position. It's the first position and it's dialed down. Now it's stopped measuring and if you look here it's asking you to place it in position 2, dial up and then click around to continue. So let me turn it around. I'll click run again and note it's saying stabilizing position. So even though you can see all the data above and the tape is running, it's not being accounted for. I set the stabilization period for 10 seconds but you can set it for as long as you want. Now it's measuring, you can see that here. I set the measuring period for each position for 30 seconds and if you look here it tells you the elapsed time and how long you set it for. Again, you can set the measuring position for as long as you want. With the positional timing you can set how many positions you want. You might want to do 5, 3, whatever. And you can set the order in which you want them to be executed. These are the basics you see on the Chinese time grapher, but the time grapher will not give you any results. You can't go back and look at the trays etc. Most importantly, what this does and the time grapher doesn't, you can run diagnostics. The time grapher tells you the rate, the beta error, the amplitude, and that's about it. With this, you can diagnose incorrect locking, inappropriate draw, lever horn rubbing on the roller jewel, safety pin rubbing on safety roller, scored balance pivots, sticky hairspring, etc. It's new to me. I'm going to have to get my head around it before I start showing you anything, but it will come in my future videos, and when I have enough of different footage, I'll do a separate video on this software so you know how to use it properly. At this moment, I can't advise you because it's very new to me, but you can contact the people who sell this software. I will leave the links in the description. What you haven't heard, what I have cut out, is the sound of the escapement. It didn't complement my wonderful narrative in my ropey English accent. Graphically, it's been right in front of you all the time. These two. So what we're going to do is skip towards the very end. I'll let you listen to it for a few seconds and we'll get to see the results. Now that is the sound of the escapement. If you've seen my previous videos, you might have noticed that I always muted the sound on the time grapher. It was just purely annoying. I never ever had it on. This one, I always have it on because I can hear what's going on. But let's have a look at the results. They are down here. Dial down, dial up, pendant right, pendant down, pendant left, pendant up. Pendant being the crown. Dial down and dial up should be as close to each other as possible. And in this case, it's very good. The rate is very close, the amplitude is almost identical, and the beat error is close. This is the duration, how long it was timed in each position. The deltas, the rate is the difference between the fastest and the slowest rate of all the positions tested. The rate D shows the difference between the two dial positions. The delta P shows the maximum difference between the pendant positions. There is also amplitude falloff value showing the greatest difference between two amplitude values. I could carry on showing you other stuff, but we still have some work to do. I hope you enjoyed it. Something different to the time graphers you are used to in YouTube videos. Now I'm going to put the second reduction wheel in place. I'm using Mobius 9501 here. A little bit on this side as well, just so you can see it. I'll tidy it up. It does need some grease on the underside. See that pinion here? That's what makes contact with the ratchet wheel. When this wheel turns, the ratchet wheel also turns. It's upside down now, you won't see it when it's installed. Now it's the right way up, and I'm having to speed it up because it took me a while. It's a little bit, I think the technical word is fiddly. Yeah, that's the correct term. Three slots on a screw, it's reverse threaded. A little test before I tighten it. That looks good, so let's make sure it stays in place and tighten it fully. That's it. Let's test it once more. It's looking good. Now we need to put some grease on the side of the reduction wheel. I'm using Mobius 9501. I put a little bit on, turn it, 
little bit on, turn it, I go round the wheel, I don't think you need to watch the whole thing, so I'll cut to here. Let's test it and we'll have a look at it from the top. The first reduction wheel turns either direction, that in turn moves the pole lever, which turns the second reduction wheel, it will always rotate anti-clockwise, that turns the ratchet wheel, which winds the mainspring, and the ratchet wheel is arrested by the click here. You've got some rust there, Leo. I know I didn't see it. I need new glasses. That's not an excuse really, is it? I should be inspecting parts. Bad boy. I still need new glasses though. I've not been the optician for four years. I can't afford them. I spend all my money on watch tools. Escapement analyzer or glasses? The analyzer, obviously. That was 9020 on those burnings, by the way. On the underside of this rotor, there's a gear that makes contact with the reduction wheel I was moving with the probe before. So whenever you move your wrist, the rotor moves, it moves the reduction wheel, and you've seen the chain reaction, how it winds the mainspring. It's not just slap it on, you have to align the hole in the reduction wheel with the hole in the balance arm and the middle of the rotor with the stem. Let me move it so you can see it. See that there? That's what it's got to be. I'm not sure whether every Seiko manual tells you to do it this way, but all the ones I've seen tell you to do it like this. So let me tighten it and let's have a look at it. Let's rotate it. There we go, that's what it needs to be. We're on the dial side now, this is the area we'll be focusing on. Little bit of 9501 for the minute wheel post. This is for the intermediate date wheel and date finger. That's for the intermediate date wheel. That's the date driving wheel. This is the date finger. This is the intermediate date wheel. It connects the hour wheel with the date driving wheel. Minute wheel, that's a bad name. It's an intermediate wheel really. The friction fitted cannon pinion drives the wheel here and that's geared up to drive the hour wheel. To recap this, this is the cannon pinion that's friction fitted on the center wheel arbor that turns once an hour hence the minute hand is fitted directly on the cannon pinion. As it's friction fit, it will slip when you set in the time. This is the hour wheel, it does one full rotation every 12 hours and the hour hand is directly fitted on this wheel. And this little pivot here, that's the fourth wheel, it does one full rotation every 60 seconds, the seconds hand is fitted directly on this pivot. Get it? Cool. Now let's have a little fiddle to see whether everything interacts nicely. Cannon pinion turns, hour wheel turns, the date mechanism turns, what else do you want? Little bit of 9501 for the day jumper here, little bit on the post. Now let's put it in place, took the tail in, bit of 9010 here, little bit on this side, and we can put the day dial on, nice and centered, and the day jumper needs to go here. Now let's put the day dial guard in place, I'll secure it with the four screws, I'm getting really good at this, it only takes me a few seconds, it's just practice, nothing else. See, all done. I'll test the quick set date, that's with the crown in the second position. Turning the crown clockwise makes it skip, which is what we want, and anti-clockwise, it changes the date. I'm going to clean up the dial a little. We have some blemishes here, but it's going to be hidden under the crystal. There's some around the Seiko branding too, but I'm not concerned, it doesn't bother me. Dial washer, dial ring. Now let's put the dial in place. Make sure the dial feet are in. We have the eccentric screws to secure the dial feet in place here. Now let's advance the time until the date changes so we can fit the hands at 12 o'clock. To do this properly, you have to be in the kitchen, on your knees, stone floor, one light blocking your way and you avoiding the other light. Ask the professionals, that's what they do. They might deny it because it's a trade secret. But that's the best way of doing it, trust me. Now that's the hour hand and I placed it on the hour wheel. I'm not pushing as yet, just holding it in place so I can straighten it. Now I can give it a push. That's it. Now the minute hand, that goes directly on the cannon pinion. You kind of have to take your time and get it nice and straight. Kind of, that means you have to be fairly quick because the time advances and you want the hour and minute hands to be perfectly aligned and the day to change at 12 o'clock. If you're not quick enough, you might have to take the hands off and start again. Now let's give it a push. Here we go. 
The second's hand, that goes directly on the pivot of the fourth wheel. You don't have to rush here, you can place it wherever you want, it doesn't have to be at 12 o'clock. Satisfaction The case looks like a piece of scrap metal. It needs polishing, it needs to look presentable. I think it's had a tough life. And the crystal, we can polish that. And that needs to go. That's pegboard, shaped to fit the slot, soaked in horosol, and I'll try to remove as much as I can. That's a lot of rust. Whatever rust remains, I'll brush some rust remover there, just in the slot nowhere else, and I'm going to leave it for a few minutes. And that looks much better. I'll polish the case, the case back, the crown, and the crystal. If you want to see the polish in a lot more detail, I'll put a link in the description to my previous video. It's all there in detail, which compounds I'm using, how I do the brush finish, how I polish the crystal, etc. Check it out if you're interested. What do you think, guys? I hated the case when I got it, but I like it now. It's amazing how a bit of polishing can transform a case. Let me make sure everything is where it should be. I'll lift the plastic here so you can see it being pushed in, hopefully. That's it. We're in. It's not running fast. I'm speeding the footage up. Let's put the stem in, freshly lubricated with Mobius 9504 grease. Now the movement ring. And I'm going to use the Fomblin UT18 to lubricate the gasket. I'll put the gasket on. I'll be super quick. I'm not a human. I'm a YouTube character. Different physics apply. Your quantum physics are a joke. Let's put the case back on, first with my fingers. And it also needs a nice tight seal with the case back tool. It needs a tight seal to keep the specialists with WD-40 away who may want to revive it at some point in the future. We're almost there. I found a beautiful strap. It looks much nicer than what you can see. The camera doesn't do it justice. It looks somewhat darker than it really is. The color was described stone grey. Could be any stone though, couldn't it? I get my watch straps from a place called Watch Obsession. They don't know about me. They are probably having board meetings trying to work out what they've done right to increase the traffic to their website. I wish I could watch that. I'll put the link to their website in the description anyway. There we have it. That's it. Bye. You wanted to see it? All right then. What do you think? It's not going to be to everyone's taste, but I like it. I really, really hated it when I got it, but it's not been off my wrist since I finished it. It's a nice little watch that's suitable for almost any occasion. I hope you will now feel confident jeweling, and if you don't repair watches, I hope you understand how it's done. Guys, if you enjoyed it, give it a like. I know it's a lot of effort to click or tap on the thumb. It might sound easy, but there is a lot going on. Neurons are sending messages from the brain. It goes vital spinal cord to the nerves. Electrical signals are being translated into chemicals. Then the chemicals are being translated back into electrical signals. I know, it's hard work. And don't forget to have a look at the links in the description. There are lots of useful links. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, make comments. If you want to support the channel, you can buy me a digital coffee or use the Super Thanks YouTube option. And I best be getting on with another watch. Bye for now.